The next presentation is Mechanisms of Pediatric Head Injuries in Team Sports, Implications for Prevention, presented by Newton Cho. Thank you very much. Uh, before I started, I really wanted to take the time to thank the ANS for giving us, uh, our group, the opportunity to present here today at this venue. Uh, we have no real uh, financial conflicts of interest. Uh, Dr. Cusimano, uh, who edited this study, is a non-paid voluntary vice president of Think First Canada. At present time, there's a dire need for injury prevention research in head injuries in team sports and the pediatric population. I say this really for three reasons. First of all, head injuries are very common in sports. More than a million sports-related head injuries will occur in our kids this year in the U.S. alone, and up to 21% of all traumatic brain injuries in children and adolescents in the U.S. will be due to sports. Number two, sports-related head injuries have very devastating consequences. Case in point, Zach Listed, who was a 13-year-old up-and-coming football player who suffered a concussion while playing on the field and was allowed to return back to play prematurely, suffering a second head injury that resulted in him being debilitated for the rest of his life. Not only was his life changed, but the life of his family, his friends, his coaches, his peers, so much so to the point that the Lifestead Law was passed in 2009 mandating change to ensure that we prevent head injuries from occurring in team sports and kids. Finally, every time we allow our kids to step onto the court, to step onto the field, to step onto the ice, they're at risk for head injury. There are many advantages associated with sports, including development of team building skills, development of self-esteem, and improvement of physical well-being, but we need to balance this against the risk of head injury. And we need to find ways to prevent head injuries from occurring so that we can allow our kids to participate safely. When we look at the current state of research into sports-related head injuries, there are still major gaps. A lot of the research has focused on sports such as hockey and football, and although other studies have started to look at other sports, there's been a big epidemiologic focus. We understand who's getting injured, we understand rates of injury, but what we don't understand is exactly how our kids are getting injured. And our study is the first to really comprehensively look at specific mechanisms of injury in a wide range of team sports. And so the objectives of our study really were to characterize team sport related mechanisms of head injury and looking at how those mechanisms differ based on gender and age. So what we did was we performed a, a retrospective descriptive study looking at data that was collected prospectively through the Canadian Hospitals Injury Reporting and Prevention Program administered by the Public Health Agency of Canada. And what this is, it's an emergency department surveillance database administered by 11 pediatric hospitals throughout Canada as well as four general hospitals, whereby every time a patient comes into the ER, they're asked to fill out information with regards to basic demographics, the timing of injury, the exact circumstances surrounding the injury, the mechanism of injury, and the physician is then asked to fill out information with regards to the treatment and whether or not the patient was admitted as well as the diagnosis. So what we did was we extracted cases of team sport related brain injuries between the years of 1990 and 2009 for children between 5 to 19 years of age. And we did this for six sports, ice hockey, soccer, football, basketball, baseball, and rugby in both organized and informal settings, as well as urban and rural settings. We then proceeded to look at each case and manually coded the specific mechanism of injury associated with each case using a specific list of mechanisms that we generated for each sport. This list of mechanisms was very specific, including, for example, mechanisms such as check from behind into the boards or hit by a baseball bat. And then we categorized these specific mechanisms into six larger mechanistic categories, which you can see there, including collision or contact with other players, falls, dives, or trips, hit by a ball or puck, hit by a sports implement such as a baseball bat or a stick, contact with an obstacle or, or fixed object in the environment such as a goalpost or net, and other. What we found was there were just under 13,000 sports-related brain injuries in the CHIRP database, which accounted for just over 16% of all brain injuries in the database. Most of the injuries were males, with an average age of 13.5 years, and most of the injuries occurred in urban areas and in organized settings. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to present the results specific for each sport, and I'm going to present this when we look at all the injuries that occur in each sport, what proportions of those injuries are due to the different mechanisms that I outlined earlier. 
Hockey accounted for the largest proportion of injuries in our study, and as expected, in blue, as you can see there, contact with another player was the major mechanism of injury. But when you look more specifically, we actually see that a large proportion of our kids are still getting injured because of checks from behind. In addition, in the red there, you can see that in the five to nine-year-old group, there's a large proportion of our kids who are simply getting injured because they're falling on the ice. Another point I wanted to uh, uh, read, or, uh, say to you today is that when you look at males and females and compare the distribution of, the, of injury mechanisms between the two genders, we see that they're very similar. When you look at the blue compared to the blue, the red compared to the red, and so on. In soccer, which accounted for the second highest number of injuries in our study, again, player-to-player -player contact accounted for the largest proportion of injuries in soccer. More specifically, in the 10 to 14-year-old group, we saw that 20% of injuries were due to head-to-head -head collisions, and 30% of injuries in the 15 to 19-year-old group were due to head-to-head -to -head collisions. In addition, uh, we see that kicks to the head accounted for a large proportion of injuries, especially in the 15 to 19-year-old group. When you look at the younger age group, in the purple, we see that a large proportion of injuries, in this case 12.5%, were actually due to contact with fixed structures in the environment, such as a net or goal post. Again, when we compare the distribution of injury mechanisms between males and females, we see that they're very similar across ages. Football accounted for the third largest amount of injuries in our study, and as expected, contact with other players accounted for the greatest proportion of injuries, more specifically tackling, which you can see in blue there. Similarly to soccer, we found, especially in the five to nine-year-old group, that 22% of the injuries were due to contact with fixed structures in the environment. Again, when you compare males and females, we see that the distribution of injury mechanisms are very similar. In basketball, again, player-to-player -player contact in the blue there accounted for the largest proportion of injuries. More specifically, we see that a large proportion of injuries are due to elbowing, especially in the 15 to 19-year-old group. Again, I want to draw your attention to when we look at males and females and compare the distribution of injury mechanisms, we see that they're very similar. In baseball, the story is completely reversed. It's not player-to-player -player contact that's causing most of our injuries, but it's really injury due to the ball, which you can see in blue there, and injury due to the bat, which you can see in purple there. And when we look specifically at injury due to the bat, especially in the five to nine-year-old group, we see that most of the kids are getting injured simply because they're too close to the batter. Again, when we compare males and females and the distribution of injury mechanisms, we see that they're very similar. Finally, in rugby, we see that the main mechanism of injury, as expected, is contact with other players, namely tackling. And again, when we compare males and females, we see that the distribution of injury mechanisms are very similar. So what does this all mean, and how do we move forward? Well, our research shows that we really need to implement broad-based intervention strategies, and as neurosurgeons, we have a pivotal role to play in this regard. We have pivotal roles not only in terms of education, in terms of engineering, and in terms of enforcement of our rules and economic incentives. I don't have time today to talk about economic, economic incentives, but in terms of education, we need to advocate for broad-based programs that continue to develop skills in our kids so that when they step onto the ice, they have the proper skills to prevent falls. We also need to continue to educate our kids to continue wearing the right protective gear so that if they do fall, they're protected. We need to continue to educate our soccer players to head the ball safely, to perform scissor kicks safely, and we need to continue to educate our football players to not spear and to not use their helmets to inflict damage on other players and prevent head injury in this regard. We should continue to advocate for broad-based programs that help with teaching basketball players not to bring their elbows up when they're jostling for position under the paint and to really prevent head injuries in that regard. And also, when we have our kids who are waiting to, to go to bat and who are waiting for their turn to really just stay a safe distance away from the batter so that these really preventable injuries are not happening to our kids. And finally, with rugby, we need to continue to educate our kids to tackle appropriately and safely. In terms of rule enforcement, we really need to crack down on checking from behind in hockey. Checking from behind has been a legal maneuver for the past 20 years, but our study shows that it's still a significant mechanism of injury. We need to make stricter rules for checking from behind, and we need to enforce those rules appropriately, and we need to advocate for that change as neurosurgeons in the community. We also need to consider soccer in terms of more research surrounding the use of head protectors, given the prevalence of head-to-head -head contact and kicks to the head, 
and the possible use of penalties for high kicks that are causing injury to our kids. In terms of engineering, every, every field or pitch in our nation as well as around the world that have the capabilities should have, have, have padding on all the goalposts and nets. The fact that our kids are suffering injuries simply because they're running into goalposts or nets suggests that we really need to find ways to prevent these injuries from occurring. And really by adding, goal, adding padding to these goalposts or nets, we believe that that will help in a long way. In addition, the fact that a lot of our kids are getting injured simply because they're being hit by the baseball suggests that we need to ensure and advocate that all our baseball players are wearing helmets at all times to ensure that they're protected. And finally, our study shows that the mechanisms of injury are very similar between females and males. Both females and males should be targeted equally. They should be included in all injury prevention efforts that we advocate for. And they should be, females should be equally addressed in the same way that we're addressing male injuries and hopefully preventing injuries to our kids as we move forward into the future. I just wanted to take the time to really thank the Injury Prevention Unit at St. Michael's, as well as the Canadian Traumatic Brain Injury and Violence Research Team there, as well as CIHR and ONF for their generous funding, as well as the AANS again for giving us the opportunity to prevent our, present our injury prevention research today at this venue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our discussion will be Dr. Richard Ellen Bogan. on the way up there. Um, this was a superb paper. First, I want to thank the Scientific uh, Committee for permitting me to comment on this paper. Uh, this was a superb paper uh, by an excellent group of researchers to determine two things. They wanted to know if the mechanism of injury, if they can find targets of injury in youth team sports that they could then modify and see if these mechanisms would uh, directly prevent further injuries. So the, one of the powers of this study is that they use the Canadian Hospital Injury Reporting and Prevention Program. Although we have the CDC, we don't have an equivalent system in the United States, and I'm hoping that um, by presenting this data, there'll be more data out of this particular database, which is an ER surveillance database of 11 pediatric and four general hospitals. That are re it's really uh, specific to Canada, and, uh, and it shows you the power of being able to have that centralized system, analyzed data. Um, the results were stratified by sport, gender, and age. Huge number of injuries. The interesting thing is when we looked at the particular sports in Canada, 44% were hockey. Um, and if you look at the injuries, the targets, in five to nine-year-old kids, it's falls. In 10 to 14-year-old, it's collisions. And in 15 to 19 year old, it's checking from behind. So the conclusions were that sports related uh, TBIs are preventable, body checking a leading risk on ice hockey, and that despite the rules, the enforcement of the rules is what's lacking to prevent that culture change. And, um, and in, in what they're advocating for is stronger rules, educations for proper techniques, enforcement, and culture change. Now let's look at the ha hockey. Clearly seeing hockey being checking from behind. And soccer, what was interesting about soccer is it's not heading the ball because the ball deforms. It's head-to-head -head collisions or collisions from uh, head to feet. If you look at the CDC data from the United States, the um, injuries are a little different. Um, you could eliminate football, soccer, hockey, and you'd still have an enormous number of traumatic brain injuries because bicycling and the playground uh, provides us with a great number of TBIs. So eliminating uh, falls as one of your target is going to be very difficult. Now, interestingly, in our country, because of Title IX, uh, we are injuring women as, men, as much as we're injuring men. And um, in youth sports, you can see if you take the same sports and compare girls to boys, 
girls have a higher increased incidence of concussion versus boys in the same sports. Maybe it's reporting uh, bias. Girls might be more honest, head size, neck size, hormonal influences. So what makes a difference when tested systematically? Well, what are we going to do if you make rule changes, does it work? We looked at that at the NFL. As you know, this year changed kickoff rules, and guess what? When you kick off from the 35-yard line, you cut the concussions in half. That's the good news. And you can see the reason you cut the concussions in half by changing rules and laws is that um, you have less returns, so you have more touchbacks. The bad news, the downside of changing the rules is the incidence, the incidence per concussion per event is just as high. So although we've cut the concussions in half, if the ball is returned, the incidence of concussions is just as high. The Zach Leistet rule um, law, which has now been passed in 34 states, protects youth athletes. And we are studying the effect of this in the United States to see if it's cut down both catastrophic and concussion. And with 34 states now passing the rule, kids are not re being returned during any particular practice. If a kid is concussed in a practice, he does not return, and he cannot return to, he or she cannot return to play unless, they, um, unless they're cleared by a healthcare professional. The end of the deal, um, as this paper so uh, nicely showed, what works to decrease traumatic brain injury in youth sports? It's probably all of the above. Rules changes, culture change, enforcement, education. Thank you very much.